Hi everyone, and welcome to lesson 66, where we're talking about um, curve analysis. When we've really, if you consider the last few lessons, we've been talking about curve analysis for a little bit. Um, whenever we're talking about intervals of increasing and decreasing, um, we're talking about critical points, relative mins and max and global minimums and maximums, and when we're talking about concave up, concave down, and inflection points, those are all just kind of mini topics in curve analysis. So in this lesson, we will review the last few lessons using a neat reference chart I made that hopefully makes things a little bit simpler. And then we're going to uh, do some example problems like, like that one. So um, let me jump over to concavity vocabulary. So this should be in the course references that you can find on the Dropbox and you can find on the Google Classroom. And so here's this little table that hopefully clears up any confusion that maybe we had before. So the way you read this is, in this row, we're talking about the function itself, f of x. If f of x is less than zero, that's just telling you your function is negative, right? So not rocket science. If f of x is equal to zero, then in vocabulary words, we say, well, then x, that point in the domain, that's a root of your function. So if f of x is equal to zero, that means x is a root. If f of x is greater than zero, that just means your function is positive there. Again, not too complicated. Now in this row, we're talking about f prime of x, which is the derivative of the function with respect to x. Now, if f prime of x is less than zero, that tells you that the function is decreasing. Let me repeat that. If the derivative is less than zero, or you might say the derivative is negative, um, you know, that means that your function is decreasing. So the derivative is negative and the function itself is decreasing. Now, if f of x, or sorry, excuse me, if f prime of x is equal to zero, that means that the point with coordinate pair x comma f of x is a critical point of f of x. So um, again, let me write here, if the derivative is equal to zero at that point, that means it's a critical point. That's just the definition of that vocabulary word, critical point. Now, if f prime of x is greater than zero, we end up here. f prime of x is greater than zero, that means that it's positive. Then that means that your function itself, f of x, is increasing. If the derivative is positive, that means the function is increasing. Okay. Now, um, moving down here, when we're talking about the second derivative of the function with respect to x, if that's less than zero, then um, you know your second derivative, oops, if your second derivative is less than zero, that means that second derivative is negative. And when the second derivative is negative, we say the function is concave down. And that also means that the derivative is decreasing. Okay, now if the second derivative of f with respect to x is equal to zero, that means that this point with coordinate pair x comma f of x, it's likely an inflection point of x, but maybe not. So in the last lesson, we talked about those situations where you might have a decoy and as an example, really quick, I'll mention, um, you know, uh, for the maybe not side, I'll mention the function x to the fourth power that has one of those decoys in there where uh, the second derivative is equal to zero, but it's not an inflection point. But, you know, when the second derivative is equal to zero, it's likely an inflection point in most, most cases. Um, and that also tells you that the, the point with coordinate pair x comma f prime of x, that's going to be a critical point of the derivative. Okay, finally, whenever the second derivative of your function is greater than zero, that means that the second derivative of your function is positive, and that means that 
your function itself, f of x, is concave up, and that means that f prime of x is increasing. So your derivative is increasing when the second derivative is positive. Okay, so hopefully this table is a nice visual summary of what we've been learning in the past few lessons. So some extra points that I want to drive home that I think we've talked about, but I just want to make sure that it's, uh, that it's clear. So it's, it's worth repeating that a relative maximum of the function occurs at a critical point of f of x where f of x is concave down. So this is the same thing. Critical point means the derivative is zero and concave down means that the second derivative is less than zero or negative. Okay, now a relative minimum of f of x occurs at a critical point where f of x is concave up. So again, critical point means the first derivative is zero. Concave up means that the second derivative is greater than zero. An inflection point of f of x occurs where the function flips from concave up to concave down or vice versa. So an inflection point is also where the, con where the function flips from concave down to concave up. At every inflection point, the second derivative is equal to zero. However, not every point where the second derivative is equal to zero is an inflection point. And again, that's what I mentioned before. Consider the function x to the fourth power. That definitely has a point where the second derivative is equal to zero, but is not an inflection point. But in fact, in most cases, in, in fact, at an, every inflection point, the second derivative will be zero. It's just uh, the converse isn't always true. Okay, and then the last little bit I have on this reference sheet that I should read is that if the derivative is, con sorry, let me back up. If the function f of x is continuous, then every critical point of f of x is either a relative maximum, relative minimum, or inflection point of f of x. However, an inflection point of f of x does not have to occur, occur at a critical point. What a mouthful. Let me read that one more time and we'll move on. If the function f of x is continuous, then every critical point of the function is either a relative maximum, relative minimum, or inflection point of the function. However, an inflection point of f of x does not have to occur at a critical point of f of x. Okay. So that's one reference page. Um, I think I should also mention this. Uh, this is in the course. Um, this is in the course resources on the Dropbox and on the Google Classroom, uh, and it's called "Stuff You Must Know Cold," which is the stuff that I want you to know when you're going into your big exam later this spring. Um, this is stuff you should absolutely have memorized so that when you wake up in the morning and roll out of bed, you you know this and you could be quizzed over it and make a hundred. So. Um, specifically, what I want to talk about is, let's see, a critical point. So a critical point of a function is where the first derivative of that function is equal to zero. And that should check out with our previous knowledge. A relative minimum is where a function has a positive second derivative at a critical point. Positive second derivative meaning concave up. And a relative maximum is where a function has a negative second derivative at a critical point. Having a negative second derivative means the function is concave down. Um, so hopefully that checks out. An inflection point of a function is where the function changes from concave up to concave down or vice versa. So it's where the function changes concavity. At every inflection point, the second derivative is equal to zero. Um, however, not every point where f prime of x is equal to zero is an inflection point. So um, make sure we're familiar with that. And I'm just going to give you a quick, a quick preview of next lesson, what we're going to go over in the very next video. So in the next video, we're going to go over uh, five theorems. The intermediate value theorem, which we've definitely talked about before uh, last fall in a little bit this spring, but going to treat it more in the next video. Um, we're going to look at, in the next video, the mean value theorem. 
we're going to look at another theorem that the AP exam doesn't call out uh, by name, but is still very good to know, um, which is Balzano's theorem. Very closely related to the intermediate value theorem. We're going to talk about the extreme value theorem, and we're going to talk about Rolle's theorem. Okay, so uh, that's stuff to look forward to. Now, like I promised, in this lesson we are going to also work some examples. So, example one. The absolute minimum values of the function f of x is equal to x cubed minus 3x squared plus 12 on the closed interval from negative 2 to 4 occur at x is equal to what? Okay, um, minimum values. So minimums have, to, or at least relative minimums, they have to occur at, uh, for the most part, critical points. For the most part, whenever the, the, you know, the first derivative is equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is take the first derivative real quick, 3x squared minus 6x, and um, set that equal to zero and see what we get. So uh, what I see is that I could factor this into x and 3x minus 6. And so that means that x is going to be equal to either um, 0 or 2. So these are critical points at x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 2. These are my critical points. This is where the first derivative is equal to 0. So these might be minimum values. Now, um, the test about whether these critical points are minimums uh, really comes from finding the second derivative, uh, which is going to be then 6x minus 6 and setting, um, and, and really, really evaluating uh, at each of these points, like f double prime of 0, what is that? Well, that's negative 6. And so here, at that critical point, um, my second derivative is negative, so it's concave down. And so that's going to be a maximum. At x is equal to 0, that's going to be a maximum of this function. Um, what about the critical point x is equal to 2? Well, f double prime of 2 would be equal to 12 minus 6 is equal to positive 6. So that is going to be concave up since the second derivative is positive. Uh, so that's going to be a minimum. If you have a critical point where the function is concave up, that means it's a minimum. And so what is the value of this function there? I mean, I'm just curious, what is f of 2? That's going to be 2 cubed, that's 8 minus 3 times 2 squared, that's minus 12, plus 12, this value is 8. And um, I mean, I, I just want to bring this to your attention too. Whenever you have a closed interval like this that goes from um, negative 2 to 4, that's inclusive, so it includes negative 2 and 4. And suppose, you know, we've got this uh, maximum at x equals 2, this minimum at x Sorry, the maximum is at x is equal to 0, and we have this minimum at uh, x is equal to 2. So your function really could look like um, this. It could go like that, where maybe... I'm not saying this is how it is. I actually don't know. I haven't worked this problem yet. But suppose that's x is equal to 4. This is the minimum, which occurs at x equals 2. This is the maximum that occurs at x is equal to 0. And then this starts at x is equal to negative 2. And if we're only talking about this function on the closed interval from negative 2 to 4, um, actually this right here, notice this one, that guy becomes a possibility. Because uh, we're talking about absolute minimum values. And so it very well could be that the point x is equal to negative 2 is at the absolute minimum of this function on this interval. So um, it's kind of unfortunate because that's not a critical point, but that's the weirdness that comes from just defining a function on a closed interval. Okay.
I'm going to erase just to make some room because I've got uh, one of my suspects for the minimum, right? One of my ideas is that this guy, x is equal to positive 2, could be the minimum of my function. And my other suspect is x is equal to negative 2. So now what I will do is take the function and evaluate it at negative 2 just to see what the value is. So negative 2 cubed is negative 8. Minus 3 times negative 2 squared is 3 times 4 plus 12. This value appears to be negative 8 minus 12 plus 12. That's negative 8. Okay, so look at that. Um, what I suspected might be my minimum turns out to have a value of 8, but this little tail end of my closed interval here uh, has the value negative 8, so that's actually lower. And since this is the lower value, that means it is the absolute minimum. The absolute minimum is going to have the absolute lowest value. That should make sense. So the answer to my problem is um, x is equal to negative 8. And here's a good learning experience. I just um, I just graphed it on Desmos to uh, see what it would look like. And sure enough, we do have a relative minimum right where I said at 2 comma 8, x is equal to 2 and then the value of the function is 8. But then if you go over here at the end of that closed interval at, um, at the point negative 2, you get the function value negative 8. So of course that's going to be the absolute minimum of this function on this interval. But that was a, I mean, that's a, that's a good suspect because it is the relative minimum at x equals positive 2. Okay, so hopefully that was a learning experience about the whole closed interval trick. Now, example two, what is the maximum acceleration attained on the interval um, from zero to three by the particle whose velocity is given by uh, v of t is equal to all this junk? So let's, we were given the velocity function, let's come up with the acceleration function at least, since we're asking about maximum acceleration. So the acceleration function is going to be 3t squared minus 3, whoops, not 3t, sorry, I'm taking the derivative here. Um, so that's going to be 6t plus 12. And when we're talking about maximums, like the maximum of this acceleration function, this has to occur at a critical point. So when the first derivative is equal to 0, let's find my critical points of the acceleration function. So taking the first derivative of acceleration, we get 6t minus 6, and then we set it equal to 0. So that means that t is equal to 1 at the critical point. And then let's see if this is a maximum by finding the second derivative of the acceleration function. And the second derivative of the acceleration function is just going to be 6, which is positive. So that means that the whole acceleration function everywhere is concave up. Ooh, interesting. So when your second derivative is, is positive, your function is concave up. But if it's concave up like this, at the critical point, um, that's not going to be a maximum. That's going to be a minimum. And what we actually want to find in this problem is the maximum. So in fact, at t is equal to 1, this is definitely not my maximum. That's the minimum. So instead, let's plug in, uh, you know, we have this closed interval, let's plug in the endpoints and see what we get here. Plugging in the endpoints, and we're going to plug that into the acceleration function so I can actually just sort of forget about these guys. That was a dead end. That just led me to a minimum and not to a maximum. Instead, we're going to plug in the endpoints into my acceleration function. So a of 0, what is that? Oh, it's 12. Now what about a of 3? Well, 3 times 3 squared is 27, minus 6 times 3 is minus 18, plus 12. So this is 27 minus 6, which is 21. So if we're comparing between um, t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 3, t is equal to 3 has the uh, better get. So if I had to guess what this function looks like on the interval from um, x is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, remember you have a minimum value at t is equal to 1, which we found, 
and then uh, you've got 12 over here, and then you've got 21 over here. I bet it looks like this. And the whole thing is concave up, right? The whole acceleration function. And so I think it looks like this. And so the maximum is going to be up here. Let's graph it on Desmos just to verify uh, my suspicion. Or prove it wrong. I don't know. I haven't actually worked this yet. So let's. I'm going to graph the acceleration function 3t squared minus 6t plus 12. And sure enough, here is the Desmos version. So um, you do have that relative minimum at t is equal to 1. And uh, at t is equal to 0, the value of your function is 12. And at t is equal to 3, where is that going to be? It's right here. The value of your function is 21. There it is. OK. So um, that's it for example two. We found our, our maximum. And uh, that maximum acceleration that was attained is 21. And when do we attain it? We attain it at t is equal to 3. OK. Example 3. Let f be the function defined by f of x is equal to natural log x over x. What is the absolute maximum value of f? Now, if we're looking for an absolute maximum, well, it's, it's going to be tricky, but I'm going to try to explain my thoughts about this function. So you know that the function natural log x doesn't exist for negative values of x. So the domain, let me write this somewhere, the domain of the function natural log x only exists for, um, you know, when x is part of the interval uh, 0 to positive infinity. So it doesn't allow 0 and it doesn't allow any negative numbers. Because if you were going to graph the function natural log x, I don't know, it looks something like this. Where this is x and then this is, you know, y is equal to natural log x. And so you have this vertical asymptote at that y-axis. Your function never quite reaches the y-axis because it's not defined for x is equal to 0. And um, knowing that... Uh, I have natural log x here in the numerator, and in the denominator, I'm dividing by uh, x, which, you know, one, the one at the function 1 over x looks like that, has a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis and a vertical asymptote at the y-axis. Um, and you could express this function f of x as the product of these two. Right? You could do 1 over x times natural log x, and you get the same f of x function. And so you have this sort of competition between which one of these vertical asymptotes is going to win. Is it going to look like the natural log function, where the vertical asymptote is negative, or the 1 over x function, where the vertical asymptote goes up to positive infinity as x approaches 0? And um, we can just probably tell from context clues that if we're asking about the absolute maximum, that it seems like the negative infinity version is going to win. Because if the positive infinity version wins and you have a, a horizontal asymptote, sorry, a vertical asymptote going up to positive infinity here, well then you're not going to have a maximum, you're not going to have an absolute maximum of your function. But there is actually a calculus tool built to answer this question about what happens as x approaches zero. And so let's try that out and see what happens. Um, hopefully, hopefully something good. So Let's ask about the limit as x approaches 0 of natural log x divided by x. And um, oh, sorry, I guess this really doesn't work. I was hoping that we could use a, maybe a quick L'Hopital's rule trick here, but um, if you just try to plug in x is equal to 0, you get 0 on the denominator, but then what do you get in the numerator if you take natural log of 0? So maybe this isn't exactly the easiest uh, limit that I thought it would be. Okay, so never mind. Let's scrap that idea. 
Let's grab that idea and we'll just stick to our intuition about context clues. The fact that we're looking for an absolute maximum kind of tells you that you don't have a vertical asymptote going to positive infinity, but instead you must have this vertical asymptote going to negative infinity. Okay, then knowing that, we're going to find the first derivative of this function. And we're going to have to use quotient rule because this is a quotient of functions. You have natural log x divided by x. And what quotient rule tells me is, um, you know, if you have this quotient of functions f divided by g, you're trying to take the derivative that's equal to f prime of g minus fg prime divided by g squared. Here, in this case, my numerator, my f function is natural log x. My g, my denominator is x. f prime is going to be 1 over x, and g prime is going to be 1. So applying that quotient rule, what's f prime times g? We have 1 over x times x, that's just 1, minus f times g prime, so natural log x times 1, it's just natural log x, divided by g squared is going to be divided by x squared. So here's our derivative. And a maximum has to occur at a critical point, and a critical point is where the first derivative is equal to zero. So I set this equal to zero to see what happens. And um, what this question is asking, if you're trying to set this you know, 1 minus natural log x divided by x squared is equal to 0. This whole function only equals to 0 if you think about it, that's only works if 1 is equal to natural log x. If natural log x is equal to 1, then 1 minus 1 is 0, and 0 divided by whatever x is is going to be 0. So when does, the, does natural log x equal 1? Well, let's do this. Let's put both sides of that equation um, in the superscript of the exponential function with e as a base. And I choose e as a base uh, because, well, natural log function, that's just the logarithm with base e. That's the definition of the natural log function. And I can go from this equation to that equation because, well, if natural log x is equal to 1, then e to the 1 should be equal to e to the 1, and so this works out. Now, um, hopefully you see where we're going with this. e to the first power is just e, and then e to the natural log x. The logarithm and the exponential function are inverses of each other. So whenever you compose inverse functions, you actually just get uh, the input as your output of the whole function composition. So what this, what we find here, remembering our exponential and logarithm laws, is that uh, x, my variable, is equal to Euler's number e at the um, at the absolute maximum. And so Euler's number, of course, is like two point seven one something. And uh, if you are interested, let's graph it on Desmos. So here is the, you know, here is the first derivative of our function graphed, and you can see where that zero is of your derivative, that critical point is that Euler's number, 2.71. And I can also, uh, if you're interested, graph the natural log x divided by x function. Here we go. So then at, at 2.71, we should have a maximum right there. It's very flat around the maximum, but, but it is there. Okay, but that um, I suppose that doesn't actually answer our question. It says, what is the absolute maximum? What we found is, is where the, the maximum occurs. It occurs at x is equal to e. But now let's plug in that um, value into our function. So what is f of e? Well, it's natural log e divided by e. And so that value is actually going to be 1 over e. Because if you take the log base e of e, what you're saying is, you know, 
e to what power is equal to e, and you know e to the first power is equal to e. So actually, uh, maybe the coordinate pair of your maximum is e comma one over e. And you can verify that 0.3679 is approximately one divided by e. Moving on, example four. The graph of f prime, which is the derivative of f, is shown in the figure below. Which of the following describes all of the relative extrema of f on the open interval um, from x is equal to negative four to positive five? And maybe this is worded weird. Uh, I guess maybe this was originally a multiple choice question, but now it's an open-ended question. So we want to describe all the relative extrema of f on the open interval. Um, relative extrema is going to be where these critical points happen, I think. And so here, my derivative is going from negative to positive at this critical point. Remember, this is this whole blue curve is the func is the graph of f prime. It's not actually the function itself; it's the derivative. And so, this derivative is going from negative to positive here. So, as it goes from negative to positive, we should think um, the function is going to go from decreasing to increasing. When you have a negative derivative, that means your function is decreasing. When you have a positive derivative, the function is increasing. So your function is going from decreasing to increasing. Let's say this is the graph of f. And so if it's going from decreasing to increasing, this point right here is what we would call a relative minimum. And then here at this point, your function is going from increasing positive values of your derivative to decreasing because of negative values of your derivative. And so it's going from you know increasing to then going decreasing. So at that critical point, that's what we call a max. And so this one is a maximum. And then for the same reason, your derivative goes from negative to positive here. So your function goes from decreasing to increasing. And if it goes from decreasing to increasing again, and that's what we call a minimum. So again, this is my function f of x, and this is my function f prime of x. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, how I picked out which of those critical points were maximum or minimums based on this graph that they gave us for the derivative. So I didn't even need a formula. This is how you can look at the graph of a derivative and determine you know, facts about the function itself. OK, now let's look at, look at this problem in example 5. Um, using the graph of f prime from example 4, sketch the graph of f. And actually, I kind of did that, but maybe I, um, maybe I didn't do it properly enough. So let me get rid of this. I decided it was minimum, maximum, minimum at those points. So uh, here I have some kind of minimum. And so maybe I can sketch like uh, this, some kind of minimum. And then it's going to be increasing for a long time. And it's going to be increasing a lot and then a little. And then, oops, <laughs> uh, I need to have a maximum right here. So it needs to sort of come back down from our maximum right here. Uh, whereas this is a minimum, this right here needs to be my max. I'm afraid of, I'm about to erase a lot of it, but yep, okay. I can always come back to it. And then I also need what right here? Another minimum. So uh, it's also decreasing a little bit, and then I have to hit a minimum. And then all of a sudden it seems to be uh, increasing really rapidly at the end there. So it's going to go whoop. <laughs> and this will be my graph of f of x. So your sketches don't have to be perfect, but you know, you get the idea. My, my sketch is true to the, to the, where the mins and maxes were at least. And then um, example six says using the graph of f prime from example four sketch, sketch the graph of f double prime. So let me switch colors to purple for f double prime. 
and f double prime, I'm going to look at the graph of f prime, and now say, okay, where f prime has this maximum, what does that mean for my graph of f double prime? Well, that means I have a zero, because if it's a critical point of the first derivative, that means it has to be a zero of the second derivative. And if this is a maximum, it's going from increasing to decreasing. So my second derivative has to go from positive values to negative values. And if right here, my, set, my first derivative, f prime, is going from decreasing to increasing, that must mean my second derivative, f double prime, has to go from, de has to go from negative values to positive values here. So sketching f double prime, my second derivative, is going to look a little something like that. And again, these aren't going to be 100% perfect accuracy, but that f double prime curve that at least um, that at least is is true, and has zeros where my f prime function has critical points. I don't know where that e came from. <laughs> okay. Example seven: If y is a function of x such that y prime is greater than zero for all x and y double prime is greater than zero for all x, what would that graph look like? What is a potentially correct function? So let's think about this. Y is a function of x such that the derivative is greater than zero for all x and the second derivative is greater than zero for all x. So derivative greater than zero, that means the function is increasing everywhere, or I could say that it's strictly increasing. Second derivative greater than zero, that means that your function is concave up everywhere or I might say that it's strictly concave up. So it's strictly increasing and strictly concave up. Your function can't start going down and it can't stop speeding up in the rate that it increases. So it's gonna, it's gonna be curling up forever like this. Um, so what would the graph look like? It would look like something like this. And what is a potentially correct function? Well, one function I can think of off the top of my head is suppose y is equal to e to the x e to the x is always positive, it always has positive values. And if you find y prime, that's also e to the x. And again, e to the x always has positive values. So that tells you that your function e to the x is strictly increasing. And if you take y double prime, um, that is also e to the x. And y double prime has to be greater than zero. Well, that checks out. e, e to the x only has positive values. And that tells you that the, that the graph of e to the x is strictly concave up. And if, in fact, if you look at a graph of e to the x, it starts out very humbly, and then pretty much as soon as you cross the y-axis, it goes whoop, and it curls up the whole time forever. So there's your e to the x function. It has all of these wonderful properties. Okay. Um, we're close to the end, two more examples. For what value of x does the function f of x equals x minus two times x minus three squared have a relative maximum? So relative maximum has to occur at a critical point. So that means that f prime of x has to be equal to zero there. Let's find f prime of x. I'm gonna to need to use product rule. And so um, product rule tells me f prime of g plus f g prime. I'm gonna call this one f, this one g, f prime and uh, g prime. Well, f prime is, is 1, clearly. g prime is going to be a little bit more complicated, I suppose. Um, so let's do f prime times g first. And in fact, if this is confusing you when I talk about product rule, um, we'll, I'll write out product rule really quick. So f prime times g, that's going to be 1 times x minus 3 squared. plus f times g prime, and g prime is going to be 2 times x minus 3. Okay, so here is that, and I set that equal to 0. So when is this equal to 0? Um, and that's a really great question. So let me factor out an x minus 3 here. And factoring out an x minus 3, I get uh, x minus 3 plus 2 times x minus 2, so plus 2x minus 4 is equal to 0. 
And so I think I can combine some like terms like this should be uh, 3x. I'll write it again over here. x minus 3 times uh, 3x minus 7. And that's equal to 0. So your values for x that solve that equation are going to be positive 3 or positive 7 thirds. Those are, these are critical points. These are those critical points. And, um, you know, we're, we have our critical points, but if we want to know which one is a relative maximum, we have to check the concavity. Remember that a relative maximum is a critical point where the function is concave down, and concave down means that the second derivative is negative. So we're looking for a point where the second derivative is negative here. And so what I'm going to do is if, uh, you know, if this is f prime of x over here, and I don't need that version, it's just less simplified. What I'm trying to find is f double prime of x to determine my concavity. I'm going to use product rule, I think. Uh, and so, again, just erase product rule. But f prime times g, well, it would be 1 times 3x minus 7 plus uh, f times g prime would be x minus 3 times 3, so 3x minus 9. And uh, simplifying, this is going to be 6x minus 16. And um, let's see, when is it... When is this positive? Is it positive for x is equal to 3, or is it positive for x is equal to 7 thirds? Well, when x is equal to 3, this is going to be f prime of 3 equal to 18 minus 16, which is positive 2. The f prime of 7 thirds gives you uh, 6 times 7 thirds minus 16. And 6 times 7 thirds is going to be 2 times 7, 14 minus 16, which is negative 2. And so, if, again, for a maximum, I want to know when the second derivative is negative and uh, it's at a critical point. And so the negative second derivative at a critical point is going to be at the point, wait for it, x is equal to 7 thirds. Okay, so again, relative maximum, the criteria are has to be at a critical point uh, where the second derivative is negative. It has to be at a critical point where it, the function is concave down. And so what we did is we found our critical points by finding the first derivative and setting it equal to zero and finding those values for x. And then I tested out each of my candidates for x by finding the second derivative and plugging those in, both 3 and 7 thirds, and figuring out, am I getting a positive value or am I getting a negative value like I want? And the, the critical point that gave me a neg negative second derivative just like I wanted was x is equal to 7 thirds. So there's your answer. Finally, for what value of k will the function y is equal to x plus k over x have a relative maximum at x is equal to negative 2? Oh, okay, so this might be a difficult one, but let's just jump into it. One of the things for a relative maximum is that you have to have a critical point. So what we're saying is that, um, I guess my function's called y, the, y this time, so uh, the first derivative of y has to be equal to uh, 0 at the point x is equal to negative 2. So y prime of negative 2 has to be equal to 0. Let's find that what that y prime is. So if that's y, y prime is going to be the, deriv the derivative of y with respect to x, so that'll be 1 plus, uh, or minus, I suppose, 1 minus k divided by x squared. Okay. So um, what I'm saying is that uh, when x is equal to negative 2, this whole thing has to equal 0. So, in other words, 1 minus k divided by negative 2 squared has to equal 0, and negative 2 squared 
you should know is 4. So 1 minus k over 4 is equal to 0. That only works when k is equal to 4. And man, that's, that's really not too bad. I'm going to have to double check my answer because I felt like that's way easier than it needed to be. So let's, uh, let's do the best answer checking I know how on Desmos. I'm trying to graph y is equal to x plus k divided by x. Here we go, here's my Desmos graph. And so I've plotted in red y is equal to x plus k divided by x. And I've set k equal to 4, and you can see that sure enough, when k is equal to 4, x is equal to negative 2. And for any other value of k, your, your relative maximum there um, shifts around, and it's not always at negative 2. But specifically at the value k is equal to 4, you do get that um, relative maximum at x is equal to negative 2, as we desired. So wow, that problem was a lot easier than I thought. Uh, there you go. Anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.